Good morning or good afternoon, according to your time zone. I'm Dimitrios Goulis, a reproductive endocrinologist from Greece and currently the president of the European Menopause and Anthropos Society, the EMAS. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this EMAS webinar on menopause hormone treatment beyond vasomotor symptoms. One of the main problems for perimenopausal and menopausal women are symptoms from the central nervous system with brain fog, fatigue, and irritability being among them. Another set of problems has to do with sexual health, such as loss of libido, dysuria, and urinary symptoms. Today, we will discuss exactly these issues. How do they present, and if menopausal hormone treatment alleviate them? Dr. Jose Efrain Vasquez and Dr. Pablo Gutierrez, both from Mexico, will give us the necessary theoretical background for central nervous system and sexual health issues, respectively, whereas Dr. Andonina Zmetnik from Russia will present two cases, two practical implementation of the theory. Before we begin, Emas would like to thank Abbott for their support and for making this new webinar series possible. Nevertheless, we must clarify that the scientific program and its contents are exclusively the responsibility of EMAS. Moving on to technical issues. You have entered this webinar into listening only mode. This means that your microphone is muted, so we do not pick, we do not pick up any noise from your ends. We do welcome and encourage you to submit your text questions via the Q&A widget located in your Zoom panel. Please search for it now. You can enter your questions at any time and we will read and discuss them during the end of this webinar. On top of English, this event is translated and you can choose one of the following languages, Russian, Chinese, Mandarin, Spanish, or Portuguese. You may select the language by clicking on the interpretation widget. You will find it once again in your Zoom panel. Finally, I remind you that we are recording today's webinar and it will be accessible on the EMAS website. So it's my great pleasure to present you Dr. Jose Efrain Vasquez. Dr. Vasquez works in the Obstetrics and Gynecology Department of the Spanish Hospital in Mexico, being the head of climacteric department at the hospital. He is a member of NAMS, the North American Menopause Society, and the SEOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And on top of this, he is the ex-president of the, of the Mexican Menopause Society. So he is fully suitable to discuss with us the brain fog, fatigue, and irritability. Dr. Vasquez. Hello, I'm Dr. Vasquez from Mexico, and I, I would like to uh, share with you some ideas about brain fog, fatigue in the menopause. So I would share with you my presentation. And um, first of all, we will um, uh, discuss, uh, give a definition of what is brain fog, then we will move on how frequent it is, is, is it, and then the uh, relation between aging and hormones. Is it a temporal process or definitive one? Is there also a window of opportunity for the symptoms like uh, cardiovascular, for example? What measures can be taken to reduce this problem? And then we will draw some conclusions. According to Merriam-Webster dictionary, brain fog is a temporary state of diminished mental capacity, an impediment to think clearly, inability to concentrate and to remember. And here are depicted the main uh, things of this definition. It is temporary, affects concentration, diminished ca mental capacity, the memory, and the thinking and reasoning of the person. Before we can uh, uh, responsabilize menopause to brain fog, we must uh, exclude other common causes of brain fog, 
like vitamin deficiency, caffeine withdrawal, limited movement, um, drugs, stress and anxiety, technology overload, and poor diet. Once they are ruled out, we will uh, center in this uh, according to the stages of reproductive aging of women plus 10 terminology. We will be in this window, which is ha highlighted, which begins uh, more or less uh, in the uh, early menopausal transition, then prolongs to the menopause, final menstrual period, the menopause, and extends two or three years after that. This is the window that we will have uh, this uh, kind of problems. And it's the beginning when the menstrual periods are beginning to be um, irregular, and then the period of amenorrhea. And if we look in, in the same publication, this graph, it depicts us the um, level of estrogen that in this window begins to fall very sharply, but more, much more than that, it's the chaotic pattern of secretion that causes this, this thing. Uh, after two or three years after men, the last menstrual period, we can see that the level of stratile uh, stabilizes, stabilizes again. In the contrary, here's an uh, uh, elevation of FSH as a result of hypostrogenism. According to the study of women's health across the nation, the SWAN, memory decline was the third most, most frequent symptom in uh, 40 to 50, 55 years of, of, uh, years of age women, as we can see in this graph. Here are the hot flashes, forgetfulness, and sleep difficulty. As we can see, these three uh, kind of symptoms are originated in the central nervous system. That is why it's uh, very important to deal with this topic. Uh, for our part, in the Seattle Medlife Women's Health Study, it was reported that in 230 women aged 33 to 55 years old, 60% noticed an unfavorable memory change <clears throat> over the past few years. So there are some uh, uh, epidemiological data. So is the perimenopause and transition detrimental to cognitive function? Well, there are several mechanisms through which estrogens can affect the brain. That is organizational, activational, neurotransmitter function, receptor subtype, induction of receptors, effects in the genomic and the membrane, the membrane being much more faster than genomic, Oxidative metabolism, in which uh, tries to reduce the uh, production of uh, ra free radical uh, oxygen. Apoptosis, effects on our, our uh, cells of the central nervous system, like the glia, uh, besides neurons, synapses, inflammation, and neurovascular, uh, especially blood flow. And, and that will impact those changes in uh, sex hormones will impact in some behaviors like the affective state, like mood, sleep, libido, sexuality, and social behavior. In uh, cognitive function, in the speed of processing, short-term memory, working memory, uh, etc. Motor coordination, neuroprotection, very important, neural excitability, pain threshold, and auditory threshold. So there's, there are a lot of uh, behaviors and, and uh, problems that we, can, we might find here. But uh, are there other symptoms uh, like hot flashes or lack of good, of good quality sleep related to, blood, uh, to brain fog besides the uh, direct effect of hypostrogenism? And the answer is yes. It, was, it has been determined that severe, severe hot flashes and sleep disturbances exacerbate those changes. So let's think of hot flashes, insomnia, memory lapses, depression, and anxiety, all as neurological symptoms 
because they, they all originated the same uh, region. So we have in this schema different uh, the, the uh, direct effects and the indirect ones. We said that uh, neural systems in several uh, areas are affected, like the prefrontal cortex, which tends to regulate the uh, amygdala and the limbic system, the hippocampus, which is the part of the uh, nervous system that uh, has to deal with the short-term memory, for example, and is in, in uh, close relationship with the amygdala. Let's say that the hippocampus is the part of the brain that has to deal with the rational uh, part of emotions, and the amygdala is uh, the the, uh, the heart of the of the emotion. So these two uh, structures have uh, uh, very close connections. And as uh, Dan Goldman uh, says in his book, the hippocampus is crucial uh, in clean a face as that does, is of your cousin, uh, but is the amygdala that will add that you really don't like her. And the indirect effects are in the form of sleep disturbances, most of them in form of hot flashes that disturb the this, this sleep pattern of the patient. And then mood changes that are also very related or are independent. And all, all, all of that are due to the hypostrogenism. So we uh, talked before about the timing of estrogen exposure. Um, it is now known that um, a brain the boy, uh, deprived from a long time of estrogen will be in much worse situation than a brain that has constant exposure to, to estrogen. So and that's a critical determinant and seems to be the timing of estrogen exposure in relation to the menopausal transitional transition and age of the, of the women. In the case of cognitive outcomes, some evidence supports the this uh, critical window hypothesis that uh, at the same time is the same window of opportunity that cardiovascular risk factors, for example. So the effects of hormone therapy will depend on the timing of initiation with respect to age and or the menopausal transition and that optimal effects are evident with early initiation, that is, when the brain has had a, a short, only a short time or none at all uh, exposure to low levels of estradiol. So we have stated that the brain is targeted for sex steroids. Sex steroids are not longer seen only as uh, reproductive hormones, but the systemic ones. And several studies have identified an association between perimenopause and increased rates of depression. Uh, for example, the study of women's health across the nation found a fourfold increase in major depressive ep episodes, especially in those patients who have a previous history of depression, premenstrual uh, uh, dysphoric problems, or baby blues. So the hypothesis is that the hormone management will ameliorate, but will not fully prevent brain aging. And uh, there's a, this paradigm that tries to connect biological changes that occur in other systems during the menopause transition with the risk of future cognitive dysfunction. As for example, cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, uh, overweight, dyslipidemia, et cetera, may result in cognitive decline and dementia in late life. And therefore, consider the perimenopause as a potential window of opportunity of for targeting modifiable cardiovascular risk factors and at the same time uh, brain, uh, brain health. Is it a temporal process or a definitive one? Well, there is no uh, answer yet for that question. The good news is that it seems to be for the vast majority of women a temporal one a temporary one uh, that will uh, uh, be over at around uh, four, three or four years after the final menstrual period when the levels of estradiol tend to, uh, uh, tends to uh, 
stabilized again. We know that this begins when the menstrual periods become irregular, with, uh, as we saw in the, in the graph, but the end is not as sharp as the, as the beginning. For the, the vast majority, I repeat, it's a, a temporary issue. So, there are some very interesting studies of Pauline Mackey and her co workers in Chicago. Uh, about the function of the hippocampus at this time that uh, uh, remember that I, I, I uh, explained that the hippocampus is the part of the midbrain that is uh, in relation with short-term short -term memory. And she found that the at the time of the perimenopause, uh, beginning of the menopausal transition, the memory center of the hippocampus is highly plastic. And the person, as the person ages, she must rely on the left or also begins to use the right hippocampus. So studies show that the need to recruit the right hippocampus depends on the estrogen level. The lower the estrogen, the more the recruit is, and the less, uh, the more problems of memory the patient will have. What measures can be taken to lessen this problem? There are no studies to prove, to prove that hormone therapy is beneficial, so there is no indication in the guidelines, in the official guidelines of the uh, uh, big uh, menopausal society, there is no indication for treating brain fog and problems of the central nervous system. But women with super hot flashes are related to more mental decline and memory function, treating this, those symptoms will translate into better brain health in, in an indirect way. So what uh, other measures can we take? Uh, optimize brain health uh, by making lifestyle, lifestyle changes and enhance sleep, avoid caffeine or other stimulants, relieve stress, avoid alcohol, eat well, especially med Mediterranean uh, diet, use yoga, exercise, mindfulness, Activate the brain, very important. Challenge your brain with new learning. Try to learn another language. Try to solve math problems. Try to read uh, difficult things. Stop smoking. Improve cardiovascular health and treat dep depression if it exists. So the conclusions of all this is that brain fog is a real problem, which might be, might be multifactorial. Hyperstrogenism is in a direct or indirect way, have a role in the genesis. In the vast majority of cases, is temporary and does not mean progression to dementia. Hormone therapy might be of help, but as for today, is not an indication. Hormone therapy might be helpful when used to treat based on motor symptoms. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Vasquez, for this very concise, informative, and educational lecture. Dr. Pablo Gutierrez from Mexico as well is the director of the Specialized Center for Eurodynamics and Pelvic Floor Disease in Mexico City. He's a member of the IUGA, the International Urogynecological Association, and the ex-president of the Mexican College of Urogynecology. We will take advantage of his extensive experience for learning how to choose the appropriate treatment for sexual health issues, such as loss of libido, dysuria, and urinary symptoms. Dr. Gutierrez. Hello to everybody. Thank you to the European Menopause and Menopause Society for your kind invitation for this. Um, this webinar, and I was at to to talk about the sexual health, the loss of libido, dyspareunia, dysuria, and urinary symptoms. Uh, I must mention that I don't have any conflict of interest, and the objective of the presentation will be to do um, a brief mention of the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, how does atrophy and leak of estrogen affect sexual and the urinary tract, and the importance of the hormone replacement 
as treatment of the symptoms and a brief mention also of another options of treatment. Let's remember that vaginal mucosa and urothelium change along the menstrual cycle and both of them are sensitive to the estrogen action. So in 1969, Dr. Blufino Gallo from Guadalajara in Mexico published his first edition of his book of urogynecology. And he uh, mentioned that he found a correlation between the urinary cytology and the vaginal cytology. So the changes that he uh, used to see in the superficial cells and the initial uh, uh, at the beginning of the cycle and the presence of parabasal cells in the end of the transitional urinary uh, uh, cytology were seen similar to the vaginal one. Let's remember that the ovary used to produce a 19 cold androstendion and 19 cold uh, steroid in the Teca cells. And by the way, the, by the aromatase, this 19 is reduced to 18, 18 uh, cold uh, steroids. That it depends that it has one, two, or three uh, oxidrile uh, radicals and uh, becomes an estrogen, estradiol, and estriol. And uh, the action of these estrogens are seen along the whole life of the women. We can see how the newborn has a similar aspect of the vagina as the puberty and the sexual mature woman that has a low pH, has the presence of glucogen in the, in the wall, and the presence of microbiota. And this is because the action that still remains of the maternal estrogen. One month later, this action has been lost and the aspect is similar to the menopause and the postmenopause vagina. It, the pH becomes neutral and there are no uh, glucogen and microbiota. And so in, in 2014, the NAMS adopted the term of genitourinary syndrome of menopause to the symptoms that affect uh, in the genitourinary tract that was characterized for an universal change, the atrophy, and um, it has been since that year. And as we can see, as the time passes, the vasomotor decreases, but the, uh, instead of the uh, genitourinary syndrome menopause uh, are less frequent. So, um, we could see this in this light of prevalence, how in the perimenopause, the symptoms would be between five to 15%. And maybe later, after the 60 years, between 70 to 85 in another publications are uh, present. So what symptoms are these? In the genital tract, the main symptom is dryness and also dyspareunia and vaginal itching and pain. In the urinary tract, it seems less frequent and becomes more frequent as the time passes. And they are the recurrent urinary tract infections, symptoms from overactive bladder, frequency, urgency, nocturia, dysuria, incontinence, could be urge or stress urinary incontinence, and dermatitis associated to incontinence. Let's talk a little bit about the normal female sexual response. It is the interaction of anatomical, physiological, psychological, emotional, and interpersonal uh, issues. So if we see these both patients that have some problems that used to be seen in the postmenopausal that affect the pelvic floor, well, this group collapse or this lady that has a dermatitis associated to incontinence, you could feel that the sexual response surely is affected because maybe to reduce the prolapse, this, her partner should have a, a very strong penis or the manual redu reduction could be painful and she avoids the, the intercourse or also in the dermatitis, the, the 
the pain could avoid us and other uh, emotional issues that she could feel less attracted to, to his partner. The physiological uh, changes are uh, seen because of the reduction of the hormone. The reduction of estrogen causes vaginal fibrosis. This is because a reduction in the nitric oxide synthase and the reduction of androgen cause reduction in, in all the symptoms, the symptoms that make a good response uh, to the sexual um, interaction. And the psychological, emotional, and interpersonal uh, issues uh, could be seen in, in, in this small video uh, that uh, it, it is the age where the patient maybe has the emptiness syndrome, maybe has uh, interpersonal issues with her partner, and we shouldn't have a discussion with, with them because we could be in, in big problem. This uh, <clears throat> work published on menopause in 2018 is an interview to more than 3,500 uh, postmenopausal women. And you can see how 38% of their uh, relate that uh, uh, they had affected their intercourse. And in the uh, 500 women as from the United States, 75% said that had, had some adverse effects on their sexual intimacy, and 68% had feel, the feeling of less, uh, felt less attracted to their partner. These are some images from the changes that we see in this period, age period, uh, each range. The aspect of the tissues used to be used to seem red as an inflammatory tissues. It used to be uh, with phimosis of the clitoris, and that decreased the sensation of the clitoris. And we could see atrophy, white epithelium, some cracks that could uh, cause pain during the intercourse, the phimosis, the slimmering of the epithelium and the uh, lack of uh, bulking in the major labia that could make feel the woman less attractive to her partner. Also, the narrowing of the, of the introitus and the carunculus could be the cause of the bleeding during intercourse and, during, and pain, and that it, it is a good recommendation to perform the exam with a pediatric uh, vaginal exam. Same changes are seen in the urinary tract. You could see in a cystoscopic imaging how the uh, epithelium turns white, with less vascularity, and the uh, meatus, urinary meatus, seems very inflammatory with a big carunculia. And the changes that I already told you in the cytology, that uh, turn on turn over to a less superficial cell to more intermediate and parabasal cells. We must do a differential diagnosis with an infection, with a pronate body, with infection in the urinary tract, and this leaking. Uh, I show you some images from the uh, trichomoniasis, the, the characteristic. Um, aspect of strawberry of the cervix. This is the uh, parasit. The attrapment of, of a pessary in the uh, vagina. And uh, it, uh, it's a good uh, moment to tell that when we use pessary or we uh, uh, use a tape for the treatment of stress urinary incontinence, we must use local estrogen. Um, the treatment that we have uh, are to uh, are this. We can choose for a non-hormonal therapy, the lubricants, moisturizing, and the hormonal therapy that is the most health uh, treatment, the vaginal estrogen, the androsterone. Of the we prefer 
the oral administration of permethrin, uh, this kind of serum, and the energy-based uh, therapy. And I will uh, talk a little bit about the benefits of the use of the vaginal estrogen. So they keep an appropriate urogenital blood supply. It uh, keeps the normal flora, prevents the uh, recurrent urinary tract infection, and helps to uh, improve the urge urinary incontinence. This is uh, based on evidence on the revision of 2016 of Coquimbe Bay uh, Library, how do it improve atrophy, and the uh, local estrogen reduce the incontinence in affection. Also, estriol that is a less active is a good uh, choose for the atrophy and because it increases the vascularity, improves all the symptoms of overgency, frequency, overactive bladder symptoms, and origin continence. I present rap, uh, very fast uh, some studies that the use of very low dose of estriol improves the vaginal epithelium maturation, improves quality of life, and the surgical outcome to patients that were uh, underwent to surgical treatment for urinary stress incontinence, how to they prevent the urinary tract in, infections, the recurrent of this, and how does the vaginal route is a better option, reduce the relative risk to 0.42, and the oral one doesn't modify the recurrence. This study from Slomo Raz from California, it's an old one, but it's a good one because it was, it was one of the first uh, uh, randomized studies. And, and he shows how the infection in the treated group uh, were very less than the control group. The reduction of enterobacteries in, in, in the treatment group were more than the health, and there were no reduction in the control group, and the pH also was reduced. And the presence of lactobacilli increased in the treatment group and didn't increase in the control group. Now we know the microbiome has a, a normal microbiota, and now we know that lactobacillus racemosus is a good option for the prevention of the recurrence of urinary tract infections. The contraindications in the label are the same for the systemic estrogen, so we must uh, educate our patients that the vaginal via is an um, allowed uh, presentation that we can use because it doesn't increase the levels of the postmenopausal uh, estrogens. The energy-based uh, uh, treatments, the laser uh, CO dose or Airbrajax is a, a, a good option for the treatment of atrophy because it induces the synthesize of the collagen and, and increase the vascularity. But uh, in 2018, uh, FDA published an issue about the risk of the use of this kind of treatments for cosmetic. Uh, uh, purpose and for the incontinence. I, in my personal experience, I had uh, performed an um, uh, anti-stress urinary incontinence treatment because uh, they failed to, to control this. So, in conclusion, the in the genital urinary syndrome, menopause syndrome, the vaginal estrogen are prepared over systemic. Non-estrogen therapies as are serums or the hydroepandrosterone improves the atrophy. The patients with breast cancer can we use the vaginal estrogens and it's a better idea to choose the less active estrogens and of course as to the oncologist if he allowed us to use it. And progesterone is not necessary for endometrial protection. And uh, about the urinary and pelvic club dysfunction conclusion, the systemic estrogen does improve and may worsen the stress urinary incontinence. Vaginal estrogens improve 
symptoms from overactive bladder and recurrent urinary tract and urge incontinence. And this is not still recommended for the uh, urinary health. And in sexual function conclusions, systemic and vaginal estrogens improve lubrication, blood flow, and vaginal sensation with a level one of evidence. Systemic estrogen doesn't improve sexual function, the symptoms that the first referred. And uh, we need to use it for problems in brain or hot flashes. Uh, the transdermal seems to be better than the oral via because uh, they don't affect the sex bounding, uh, sex hormone bounding globulin and the free testosterone labels. And the low dose vaginal essence improves functions of the uh, genital urinary syndrome. And I would like to thank you, your attention, and invite you to meet the natural beauties in Mexico. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gutierrez, for this very comprehensive, informative, and practical presentation. Yeah, Dr. Antonina Zmetnik accepted yeah. the task to bridge the theory with clinical practice by presenting a couple of educative cases. Dr. Zmetnik is the head of the Department of Gynecological Endocrinology of the National Medical Research Center for Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Perinatology at the Ministry of Healthcare of the Russian Federation in Moscow. She is the current president of the Russian Menopause Society and a board member of the INMAS, the uh, European Menopause and Andropos Society. Antonina, please. Uh, dear Professor Gulis, dear colleagues, I would like to thank the European Menopause and Andropos Society for the opportunity to take part in this webinar. And uh, please let me start from uh, the first clinical case. Uh, a 47-year-old uh, woman who underwent panhysterectomy for severe endometriosis six months ago presents with brain fog, mood swings, impaired memory, and sometimes feeling of muscle and joint ache that affects her work and hobbies. She is otherwise healthy and physically active. Her body mass index is 23. Past history is also significant for wrist fracture at age of 45 following a fall. She has one healthy son, 22 years of age. Her family history is significant for osteoporosis, maternal grandmother, and breast cancer, mother at age of 65. The patient is anxious regarding her new symptoms, possibility of new fractures, but is even more concerned about her risk for breast cancer given maternal history of breast cancer at age of 65. And of course, we understand that these bothersome, uh, bothersome symptoms like brain fog, mood swings, impaired memory uh, appeared after her ovaries had been removed. How should we counsel this patient and what management options are available to address patient's concerns and minimize risks? For women aged younger than 60 years of age or are within 10 years of postmenopause and have no contraindications, the benefit risk ratio of menopausal hormone therapy is favorable for treatment of bothersome symptoms and for those at elevated risk of bone loss or fracture. Menopause hormone therapy remains the most effective therapy for vasomotor symptoms and other menopause-related complaints, such as mood swings and brain fog, may improve during menopausal hormone therapy. So definitely this woman has the indications for MHT. In terms of efficacy and safety, we should take into consideration the type of menopausal hormone therapy, dose, duration of use, regimen, route of administration, prior exposure, and individual characteristics. First of all, we should consider if she has any contraindications for MHT. We understand 
that the woman is concerned about MHT safety, namely her risk for breast cancer given a maternal history of breast cancer at age of 65. Of course, breast cancer risk should be evaluated before MHT prescription. Generally, possible greater risk of breast cancer observed in some cases with menopausal hormone therapy may be decreased by selecting women with a lower individual baseline risk, including low breast density, and by providing education about preventive lifestyle measures in reducing body weight, alcohol intake, and increasing physical activity. The results of her mammograms, breast imaging reporting and data system by rats assessment category was two, and any by rats category two, it is a definite benign finding, and it is not expected to change over the follow-up interval. Usual screening follow-up is recommended, and breast density is normal. ACRB, there are scattered areas of fibroglandular density. And the pelvic examination and routine blood tests are without pathology. Dual X-ray absorption metry uh, T-score minus 1.9 in lumbar spile and femoral neck, and we can calculate FREX. This patient is not a candidate for BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation testing since she has only one blood relative with breast cancer at the age of 65, not at young age. And in this case, limited observational evidence suggests that menopausal hormone therapy use does not further increase risk of breast cancer in women with a family history of breast cancer. As annual mammograms should be proposed uh, in case of high breast density in women using MHT, our patient even doesn't need to change the frequency of her mammograms due to MHT. Since this woman underwent hysterectomy due to severe endometriosis, we should suggest combined estrogen progestogen therapy, not estrogen monotherapy. Continuous therapy, we should choose continuous therapy as she doesn't need any menstruation, her uterus was removed. In low dose, note, uh, but not in ultra low dosage as we need not only symptoms reduction, but also fracture risk reduction. Ultra low doses of MHT may reduce symptoms sufficiently and maintain quality of life for many women. However, long-term data on lower doses regarding fracture risks and cardiovascular implications are still lacking. And of course, we need to make the right choice of progestogen. If we choose uh, conjugated equine estrogens and medroxyprogesteronecidate combination, according to the WHI, we could expect a risk of breast cancer slightly greater than that observed with one daily glass of wine, less uh, than with two daily glasses, and similar to the risk reported with obesity, low physical activity, and other medications, less than one additional case of breast cancer diagnosed per 1,000 users annually, but not significant in multi adjusted statistics. Data from the WHI study demonstrated no increased risk in first-time users of MHT during the five to seven years since initiation of treatment. Several studies suggest that micronized progesterone or didrogesterone could be associated with lower risk than synthetic progestogen. And according to the latest nested case control studies for women aged from 50 to 59 using estradiol and androgesterone, there was no increased risk of breast cancer for up to five years. I would suggest oral route of administration as one of the easiest for patient to take and adhere. And there is no difference in terms of breast cancer risk between oral or transdermal estrogens. For example, the fixed combination of one milligram of estradiol and five milligrams of didrogesterone, one tablet a day. 
Next time, we can meet in a few months to discuss the efficacy, adherence, any side effects. Consideration of MHT should be part of an overall strategy, including lifestyle recommendation regarding diet, exercise, smoking cessation when needed, and safe levels of alcohol consumption for maintaining the health in postmenopause. Women taking MHT should have at least an annual consultation to include the physical examination, update of medical and family history, a relevant laboratory and imaging investigation, a discussion on lifestyle and strategies to prevent or reduce chronic disease. There is currently no indication for increased mammographic screening for this woman. No arbitrary limits should be placed on the dose or duration of usage of MHT. The risk of breast cancer with MHT should not be interpreted in isolation, and the decision should be made on an individualized basis and considered in the context of the overall benefits obtained from using MHT, including symptom management and improved quality of life and the cardiovascular and bone protective effects associated with MHT. Individualization with shared decision making remains key with periodic reevaluation to determine an individual woman's benefit risk profile. And let me introduce the second clinical case. A 43 year old woman who has been taking combined oral contraceptives for five years presents with loss of libido, vaginal dryness, night sweats, and sleep disturbance that lead to decreased quality of life. She is worried that for the last six months, she has her menstrual bleeding only for one day instead of four. She is otherwise healthy and physically active. Her body mass index is 21. She has rare sexual life. She has two daughters, 10 and 18 years, and her father had myocardial infarction at the age of 70. The result of her mammograms uh, be, uh, by rats assessment category one, it is normal, and breast density is normal, ACRA. Uh, the pelvic examination, a pap smear, and routine blood tests are without pathology. Her thyroid stimulating hormone is normal, prolactin is normal, and follicular stimulating hormone measured in hormone free period was evaluated, uh, was uh, elevated 40. And we understand that without combined uh, oral contraceptives, her FSH would be even higher, and she probably would not have any menstrual bleeding at all. On the pelvic ultrasound, uh, ultrasound examination, no pathology was found. Her endometrium thickness is three millimeters and no follicles seen in the ovaries. So the diagnosis is early menopause, genital urinary syndrome of menopause and climacteric syndrome and decreased quality of life. Uh, women experiencing uh, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency or early menopause should in principle receive treatment with estrogen doses which are higher than the doses given to women with natural menopause. As this woman has not only genital urinary syndrome of menopause, but also she has uh, other systemic symptoms and she has early menopause, that's why we need to discuss systemic menopausal hormone therapy. Since this woman has early menopause, is, is symptomatic uh, even when taking combined oral contraceptives, she has no contraindications for menopausal hormone therapy and she is already used to take tablets daily. I would suggest oral sequential combined estrogen progestogen therapy with two milligrams of estradiol and progestogen with no anti-androgenic efficacy, which is uh, important for libido. For example, didrogesterone. 
according to the algorithm for menopausal hormone therapy in peri and postmenopausal women published in Russia in 2021, there is no need to make a gap between taking oral contraceptives and MHT, as during uh, such a gap, women would suffer from menopausal symptoms. So I recommended her to start sequential combined menopausal hormone therapy with two milligrams of estradiol and 10 milligrams of didrogesterone on the day when she would start her new combined oral contraceptive package. And I also recommended her to use barrier contraception and lubricants if needed. In three months, she had significant elimination of symptoms, including genital urinary syndrome of menopause. If this would, wouldn't happen, I would prescribe her also vaginal estrogens like uh, estriol. Uh, she had regular menstrual bleeding for three days, and she uh, noticed better quality of life. I thank you for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zmetnik, for this very educative, informative, and practical presentation. Dear colleagues, I must thank all three invited speakers as they clarified many issues regarding the menopause hormone treatment beyond vasomotor symptoms. Nevertheless, a good lecture always provokes questions, so we are waiting for yours. Please use the Q&A widget located in your uh, Zoom panel. I think we have one first question, and this is from Juan Orellano. Uh, I think this will go to Dr. Gutierrez. Uh, so Dr. Gutierrez, many colleagues are afraid even of the very low dose estrogen through the vaginal route because of possible uh, consequences. For example, our colleague Jose asks, uh, what is the expected risk to endometrial hyperplasia, endometrium cancer, increase of mammarian density of breast density and uh, benign humors of the breast associated with local estrogen uh, therapy? Is it more safe than the systemic therapy? What can we answer? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, now we know that the uh, local vaginal estrogen doesn't increase any any risk of these uh, issues. Uh, we are allowed to use the, the vaginal estrogen even in patients with uh, breast cancer because we know that the level of the estrogen doesn't increase with the uh, postmenopausal blood level. So we can use it very safely. There are not long studies about the risk of hyperplasia of endometrium, of endometrium, but uh, we do know that at least the, the longest uh, studies are following for more than a year and the vaginal root doesn't increase the risk of uh, endometrial cancer or hyperplasia and doesn't increase the, the density of the uh, mam gland. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, something that I would like to ask to Dr. Vasquez, uh, it seems that sleep is very important for menopause among other areas. Uh, our era, modern era, is characterized by lack of sleep. We stay and delayed on internet. Uh, shifts have been introduced in many professions. So could you comment about lack of sleep and, and possible symptoms affecting menopause? Yes, that's a, that's a very good point because the lack of sleep is one of the factors that affects more uh, brain fog. Uh, we tend to think that lack of sleep refers only to uh, uh, the women that uh, wakes up very several times at night because of hot flashes, but that, that it's not always the, the uh, situation. As you have stated, 
uh, we have internet, we have uh, troubles, we have uh, a lot of things to think the cell phone uh, uh, besides our bed. So all those things we must educate the patient that to avoid them and try to get a good good night's sleep. Uh, in the part of the hot flashes we're talking about therapy, which is the best, uh, I agree with Dr. Smetnik, uh, is the best uh, treatment for hot flashes. But there are other uh, therapies which might also uh, help to regulate, regulate sleep. Uh, for example, if the patient has also problems with anxiety or depression, uh, it would be a good combination, in, according to the psychiatrist, to use uh, SSRIs or S -S and, um, selective serotonin, and serotonin or norepine recapture inhibitors to help to treat those, uh, that issues, those issues. Or um, maybe some herbal um, uh, tranquilizers, not, not uh, benzodiazepines or things like that, but uh, um, remedies for uh, trying a uh, better sleep. Thank you very much. Uh, a question for Dr. Zmetinik. Uh, Tonya, at some point you mentioned about uh, estrogen and progesterone in women with or without hysterectomy. Uh, would you like to clarify this, which women uh, need uh, uh, supplementation with progesterone? Thank you, Professor Gulis. Of course, uh, usually if uh, a woman had uh, undergone a hysterectomy, we do not need to add any progestogen to estrogen therapy. However, in case of severe endometriosis, even after hysterectomy, we need to add progestogen to estrogen therapy because some endometrial lesions can grow if we use the estrogen monotherapy. This is the case when we need to use the combined menopausal hormone therapy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smetnik. So this is one interesting exception, a case that in a woman with um, uh, that has undergone a uh, hysterectomy, we may need uh, to add uh, progesterone to the menopausal hormonal treatment. Uh, we have another question. It's not so relevant with today's discussion, but we will answer it anyway. Uh, what is the lowest recommended dose of estrogen for treatment of osteoporosis and dose for prevention? Uh, are there RCTs for treatment of osteoporosis? So HRT, menopausal hormone treatment and osteoporosis. Uh, would you like to, to answer it? Andonina, any comments on this? Well, I can start to comment about the lowest recommended dose. Um, there is data that uh, low dose, but not ultra low dose is effective for osteoporosis uh, the prevention. Uh, uh, if we speak about oral uh, menopausal hormone therapy, uh, one uh, milligram of estradiol uh, is uh, efficient uh, to prevent uh, bone loss uh, or a fracture. Uh, ultra low dosages um, so far uh, haven't shown uh, such benefits uh, as low dosages. Maybe Professor Gulis, you can add to this. Yes, for sure. you were very clear actually by defining the doses. So the standard dose and the uh, low dose we have evidence that it's effective. Uh, this is probably not the true, as you mentioned, uh, Tonya, for the ultra low uh, dose. I think we have answered this, and I'd like to uh, to give the uh, the speech to our. Uh, Mexican colleagues uh, uh, for a, a final a, a final comment actually about what we have discussed today and about the cases that was presented by uh, Dr. Zmedny. So, uh, Dr. Vasquez, any final comment from you? Thank you. Yes, to uh, point out that the brain fog is real, that it's frequent, and it uh, affects a lot the, the women's quality of life. So we must uh, sit and discuss these problems with the patients and make a, a, a plan for treatment. 
trying to uh, uh, first um, to 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 um, use that window of opportunity, and at the same time we are preventing cardiovascular health risks. We are preventing brain fog and problems with the central nervous system. Thank you very much, Dr. Vasquez. Dr. Gutierrez, a final comment from you. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to recommend that we need to educate our patients about the risk of the uh, systemic against vaginal estrogen. So as the label in all the estrogen uh, medications are the same about risk, the patients used to be afraid about the use of the vaginal route. So now we know that the risk doesn't increase for breast cancer, and as I told you, for hyperplasia and all that stuff. So we must talk with our patients, and we must start the conversation about genitourinary syndrome of menopause, because mainly in our country, most of the patients prefer that the medical doctor start the conversation, and we don't use to talk about these things. Thank you very much, Dr. Vasquez. Dear colleagues, we have arrived at the end of today's webinar. I do hope that thanks to our speakers, Dr. Vasquez, Dr. Gutierrez, Dr. Zmetnik, we are now much wiser regarding the menopause hormone treatment in cases beyond vasomotor symptoms. Finally, I remind you that today's webinar will be shortly accessible on the MAS website. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Bye-bye. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, bye, thank you so much. Bye.